Mara, thank you for coming and chatting to us. I mean, really, it was because a couple of years ago, I thought, I'd heard a little bit about AI and things, and I thought, ooh, it sounds really interesting. Um, and I started a, a thought process of thinking, can I recreate what I do by using an AI? That's a basic question that I started with. And we started talking to people. Um, we spoke to Yudhi's friend, um, Sebastian, who used to be the editor of uh, Ars Technica. Mm -hmm. um, we spoke to a few people just to try and get some information. Um, and it's more of a continuation of those conversations, really. And the premise of it is, can I take what I do and make a, an... Is there an AI that can do it? Is it worth doing? Is it possible? Are we overestimating what our AIs can do? Is creativity something that is outside of it? And actually, what we're liking about AI is the fact that they do nice mistakes. You know, that's sort of our, our possible. So we just launched into the conversation by saying, can I be recreated as an AI? See how that question goes down. Okay. Um, well, that's <laughs> actually, a, a, I think quite a simple question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a big question, but it's a simple one in that I, th I think it has a simple answer, which, um, th which is at this point, no. Yeah. Um, quite simply, like if you're talking about, can you be replaced? Yeah. Uh, that's definitely no. That doesn't mean theoretically it's not possible. Yeah. I, I think that someday it's plausible yeah. that it's, um, it's possible. Um, I think what we have right now, the more interesting thing is not how can you be replaced, but how can you be augmented? Yeah. Um, that is, if you want to be. You, know, you might be super happy with what you're doing, and you might not even want to um, think of new ways of augmenting what you do. No, I'm, I'm super happy to be augmented. Yeah, so I think that's the interesting thing. So on, on the journey of you know, you could embark on a journey to try and get an AI to do what you do. Yeah. And along that journey, you will discover new things about yourself. Yeah. Um, and you will branch off into different directions. Yeah. So I, I think this is the, uh, this is what I find interesting, actually. Because uh, what I'm thinking is I must, there must be a set, set of things I repeatedly do. Yeah. So we go back and look at every picture I've ever taken. There must be a set of repeated things. Part of my height will mean I hold a camera at a certain yeah. height, but sometimes I put on a tripod. So it's not always that. But there must be a certain set of re repetitive actions that I do and certain active Your habits. Yeah, habits, decisions yeah. that you subconsciously or consciously always make. Um, so that was my basis thing. Okay, well, if I've got, if I got, learn, you know, got learned behavior, I could probably pass it on to a machine to learn that behavior. Because I, I saw that project that, um, uh, I can't remember which Microsoft did of recreating uh, one of the old master painters. The Rembrandt. Rembrandt, yeah. so the new Rembrandt. Yeah. And it was kind of the same thing. They took all his traits, so he yeah. always used men of a certain age, always turned towards a certain way, et cetera, et cetera, always used a white collar, and did all the things that happened again, and produced a portrait, which for all intents and purposes looked to be looked at it quite quickly from a little bit of a distance, kind of believable. Yeah. But it didn't have any of the purpose. Yeah. So when you create a piece of work, it's always for a reason. And, you know, it's for a desire. So I want to photograph this, or I want to see that, or I want to discover that. Um, but how can... I've seen how you can feed an AI image, images after images. Can you feed it ideas, thought processes? Yeah, so this is, the, this is now kind of more complicated questions. So absolutely, you're right. Like, it's true that there is patterns in what you do. Hmm. Um, like, I don't know if you said color, I don't know if you said palettes or habits, but you know, even color palettes, yeah. you, know, you probably have color palettes that you use. So all of those can be learned. First of all, there's two things. One, theoretically, that could all be learned, yeah. um, but we're not even there yet. Mm. So things will be learned, but they're not necessarily um, directly aligned. So that's where we get all, all the kind of mistakes. The second thing is, so, you know, we talk a lot about creativity, we talk a lot about art, um, and they're kind of related, but different things, mm. obviously. Uh, and you're touching upon, I think, the difference between creativity, or well, one of the differences between creativity and art is that art is, is a form of communication. Yeah. Um, when Whoa. I think someone <laughs> either agrees or doesn't agree. No, exactly. <laughs> and everything falls out, how dare you? Um, <laughs> you know, when, when you're, 
making an artwork, you're creating a manifestation of, a, of, a, of an idea, like yeah. you said, it, of a point of view. Yeah. And when I'm look, looking at an artwork, what I'm enjoying is not just the surface aesthetics, but I'm engaging with the point of view of the mm. author of yeah. that work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So whenever people ask me, can a machine make art? I say, well, machines do make art. Currently, biological machines, us, we make art. Can a silicone-based machine ever make art? The day I care about the internal state of that machine and what it has to say, that's the day that I will have called that machine the artist, mm. um, in my opinion. That's the day that I want to connect with what it has to say. Um, Creativity-wise, I think machines are already creative. Yeah. I think AlphaGo exhibits creative behavior. Yeah. Um, and I'm prepared to argue for that. Yeah. Um, if anyone disagrees. But so when you say creativity, yeah. like although it's the collective kind of data yeah. that, that the, this AI uses yeah. and um, figure out the best possible way to, like for example, beat the AlphaGo player, yeah. would you still call that creativity? I do, yeah. So obviously, you know, words mean different things to different people mm -hmm. and so we can easily get into disagreements around definitions. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify how I think of creativity, it's um, kind of very much in line of the Margaret Bowden line of thinking that first of all, it's relative in the sense that it's in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. mm. What you might find creative, um, I might not because I might have access to information that you might not. Also, Creativity is different for the individual. Um, and for, for example, a good example that is often given is Einstein, mm. right? Very creative person. To come up with those theories, right. um, you know, to come up with those theories, he exhibited a lot of creative behavior. But some alien species might look at the general theory of relativity and go, well, duh, this is mm. so obvious. This mm. is no, no creativity at all. Mm. You know, Einstein was also a violin player. In his mind, when he was playing violin, maybe he felt like he was being creative, but he didn't really contribute to the world of violin playing. Mm. So in that respect, it's, um, relative. It, it's, it's, it's relative, yeah. So when AlphaGo made those moves, and I'm not a Go player, I don't actually know Go. I just, I'm going by what the experts mm -hmm. say and all the comments and forums. Um, and when AlphaGo makes a move and the commentator says, oh, that's a terrible move. And then 20 minutes later says, oh, now I see why it did that. Mm. Um, and when you see expert Go players say, I've never seen anything like this, like two and a half thousand years of Go playing, and we have techniques, we have chunking, we have these strategies. And then Alpha Go comes along and like a goddess, she makes these moves that they actually no call her it. a goddess. But, so if this isn't creativity, I, I don't know what is. Mm. You know, it's, um, creating actions that have value yeah. and are unheard of by, mm -hmm. by anyone. So yes, I think machines, yeah. AlphaGo is, is creative. The, the one big dif, um, point of disagreement is what, um, around agency. Mm. Do you need agency to be creative? Well, can you explain the term? Sorry? Can you explain the term? What agency? Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to get to. I think it's yeah. problematic to describe it. Right. That's why I don't require agency. Because if someone says, oh, but it has no agency, I would say, well, what do you mean by agency? Because yeah. I, I can't define it. Right. Because I think you can't, I mean, it's going to get, not to <laughs> diverge, but you can't really get into agency without talking about free will. And then that's a whole other okay. uh, bottomless pit. If an algorithm or, or an AI can be a, a creative thing, it, it's, is it missing desire? Because nature evolves and creates to keep on making itself, yeah. you know, to keep on getting better. So that, you know, we, we, we need longer limbs, we develop eventually longer limbs or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so, but it's whether, whether an AI has purpose or ultimate purpose. Yes, yeah, so, and this, this is an interesting point because it's actually a very active area of research right now. Uh, what's known as intrinsic motivation, yeah. which is, um, you know, a lot of the AI systems that we have right now, we define its purpose. Like AlphaGo was programmed to play Go. It was given an objective of winning games. Yeah. Um, it wasn't taught, I mean, it wasn't, the rules of Go weren't programmed in, it learned, but the objective was to, to win. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, when we do image classification, we give the objective. But this is too limiting. And like, the big open question is, what if we could design systems that just want to learn? Yeah. And how do, we, you know, how, how do we design that? So the, the thing is like intrinsic motivation, we give it a kind of motivation to learn. Mm. Um, and there's lots of theories of what is intrinsic motivation mm. in living organisms, so like curiosity is one. Yeah. But curiosity isn't enough because if you were curious, you would just go everywhere, you would die. So you need to balance this yeah. exploration versus exploitation. So you need to balance how much do you explore, how much do you exploit the knowledge that you already have and yeah. stay in the safe zone. Um, there's much more kind of mathematically rigorous and complicated theories of what intrinsic motivation is. But at the end of the day, even if you program those sin, someone could still argue, well, still the human has programmed in a goal. Yeah. So, and it still lacks agency. So again, this, the A word is, is a big problem. <laughs> um, but to me, it's really, really simple. If you believe in a supernatural force, yeah. then, okay, I can understand. Humans have it, and machines don't. Um, if you don't believe in a supernatural force, mm. and, and I don't, I mean, I, I think the idea of supernatural itself defies just basic logic. Yeah. Because, um, anyway. <laughs> but uh, I'm happy for you to go on to, to explain away that supernatural. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's supernatural, means it defies the laws of physics. Mm. So if it obeys the laws of physics, then it's natural mm. and it's predictable, it's trackable, even if it's not predictable like um, on a particle-particle level like quantum mechanics, it's predictable on a distribution level. Um, if it defies the laws of physics, well, so far nothing has defied the laws of physics, so it's, um, yeah, I don't know. Can you tell me just a little bit of your history, how you got to this? What would, where did you go to school? What did you study? Why, how, where did you end up? how come you ended up where you are? Okay, um, so I'm from Turkey. Right. Grew up in Istanbul. Uh, studied civil engineering, right. uh, not out of choice, but the kind of education system in Turkey at the time was such that I was good at maths, so I ended up um, in the maths, the engineering track, yeah. and I was really bad at memorizing how long rivers in the worlds were, right. and all the items on um, the peace treaties between countries and wars. So that's why I couldn't study art because humanity is required geography and history. Yeah. So I studied civil engineering um, in Turkey, finished, uh, the army said, right, your ass belongs to me now. <laughs> so I left, <laughs> came to England to uh, see what I could do yeah. apart from civil engineering. I'd always been programming since the age of 10. Right. So like, you know, in the 80s, when you switched on a computer, yeah. you just got a prompt. Yeah. If you want to play a game, you had to type load. Mm. Yeah. So I started programming in those days. And so for many years, I knew I wanted to get into some kind of visual art. Yeah. Um, I was particularly interested in abstract animation, yeah. um, abstract film. And I didn't have access to any filmmaking equipment, so I was using programming as my uh, outlet to making moving image, con moving image yeah. content. I did all kinds of odd jobs, um, and then the internet saved me, really, so I'm of yeah. that generation, post putting stuff online. Vimeo came out, uh, started posting stuff on Vimeo, communities there, um, started getting recognition, shows, yeah. and that's why I kind of ended up where I am now. Yeah. And so the AI relationship is that I've always been programming, uh, computation, I think of as a language, a language of transformation. Right. Um, that, that is literally what it is. Yeah. And so the better you're able to speak that language, the better you're able to express yourself, like a poet um, mastering the language that they speak. Yeah. And so, yeah, AI is just one step in that. I mean, I say just once, when I say AI, I'm talking about the academic field of AI mm. is just one step yeah. in that. But then the term AI has a whole other philosophical yeah. uh, uh, aspect to it, yeah. which is also very interesting, of course. Um, part of this comes, part of my interest in it, this particular project that we're, we're trying to shape at the moment, 
Um, because we, I was saying we're trying to shape it, because at the time, when I thought about it a couple of years ago, I thought, oh, well, we'll just do this. And I started to, to see the work of Mary Klingman. Um, I started to see a few He says hi, by the way. Oh, does he, right? Yeah, yeah. We can see if we can grab him as well. Um, so I started to see it. And, but the thing that sort of intrigues me is, from my own perspective, it's very hard to understand what I do to create. Yeah. So if somebody said to me, okay, Nick, it's very good, seven out of 10, but I need 10 out of 10. How do I improve? So I started thinking, well, you know, if I had, what is it, how does an image maker improve what they do? Yeah. Well, you know, if you're an actor, you can see a way of doing that. You can study your roles better. You can get more immersed. You can become more of a blank canvas, et cetera, et cetera. But for an image maker or a photographer, it's very hard to know what you pull on. It's either because there's a lack of understanding of actually how you create it in the first place. A lot of what I do is, is based around perception and desire. So I'm actually seeing something and wanting something hmm. and wanting to see something. So it's a sort of future predictive medium, just interesting in itself. But I was thinking, well, it, you know, natural human ability must tail off of age. I'm 60, so I'm thinking, well, it's going to start to tail off if it hasn't already, start to tail off in the next 20 years. So how do I keep it going? Is there some way, and you said right at the beginning of this very astutely, uh, but you talk about augmenting what you do, yeah. which is probably really what I am trying to think, yeah. you know, is it possible to find, A, to find some more understanding of how I work. Because at the moment, there's very few people I can go to and say, can you explain to me what I do? Because I don't understand it. Um, there's very few people in that position who could even begin to explain to me what I do, therefore, to get better. So I'm thinking, well, if there was a sort of idea that you had something that had all your data, your information, your, your ways of working, and they could put it back to you in an augmented way. We say, okay, well, actually, you always do this, but it's better doing this, or I'll show you what it would look like, you know, that sort of thing. So that's where my interest comes from. It partly as a sort of a desire to get a better, to become a better image maker, and partly also because of the natural decline in, in mental agility that happened with age. And also because I'm sort of thinking this is probably going to happen, that if I walked under a bus this afternoon and got killed, then in some years' time, people would be going through all the work I've done and starting to put it together. So what basically I'm saying is, in some years' time, whether it's two or five or 10 or 50, somebody will start to become, use all of my stuff to generate more of my stuff. Um, and I'd rather be involved in that in my lifetime yeah. um, than letting the military do it or somebody, you know, whoever, you see what I mean? So the thing, the people who are most active at the moment with the most money, I guess, are the military, and they will shape to some degree the advancement of AI. And surely yeah. it's better for people like you to be involved, or myself, you know, who will shape it for more, perhaps, altruistic or, or artistic or, um, you know, reasons which aren't to do with profit or killing. Um, so. Surveillance. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, you, I mean, you're 100%, I 100% agree. And so this is why, yeah, the, the question of can I get an AI to replace me is not one that I think about because I, I, yeah. I find it interesting. But trying to understand your own creative process is, yeah, is a very fascinating question. And there's a lot of people working on, on that, um, right. working on that in the sense that trying to understand what is the creative process? How do um, humans yeah. uh, you know, create? Um, how do you efficiently search that really large search space? The, so again, there's many layers to it. So you could, one could take you know, everything you've ever created dump it in a big yeah. cauldron of yeah. neural networks, yeah. and then it learns something. Yeah. The reason why I said today, no, it's yeah. not gonna, what, what I mean is, it's just gonna learn the aesthetics. Yeah. And you know, as beautiful as your aesthetics are, when people look at it, they see something more. Mm. And when you said, can you dump ideas in? Yeah. You kind of can. But the thing is, I mean, you're, you know, 60, so you've got 60 years of experience. Every bit of that is relevant. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just what you produce, but everything you've thought, you've watched, you've mm. had every conversation, this conversation we're having, every conversation you've had feeds in. So for an AI to be able to replicate you, it would have to have access to all of that. Yeah. Mm. Um, otherwise, it's just mimicking, like yeah. you said, like the Rembrandt. It's just mimicking. You know, I could get an AI to create 
paintings like this quite mm. easily. If I collect all of these, it'll create more of these. But you don't just do this for 60 years. You're going to do something else yeah. next year. Yeah. So this AI would not have to just repeat what you've done in the past for it to be really you. It would have to do what you would have done in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, yeah. if you were to be alive for another 100 years it would really replicate, it should really replicate what you, your trajectory. And to be able to do that, it needs access to your whole history. Mm. So right now, there's no way of getting access to that. Um, and there's not even computationally, it's not feasible. Right. But again, this isn't, a this isn't a theoretical limit. This is just a practical limit. Yeah. Um, so one day, I think it's plausible that we could train, you know, software on all of this. I mean, Alan Turing said yeah. famously, if we want to create an adult mind, why don't we just create the mind of a baby and subject it to the education that we subject a human to? Yeah. Um, what, what do you do about bias in that instance, if you did do that? Um, well, in a way, so bias is a tricky subject because in this particular case, bias is desirable. Bias is what defines um, the person. Obviously, bias is, is a kind of negative word in, in many ways because we think of prejudice or this gender or race um, or age or, or anything. But also the kind of more clinical definition of the word is, um, you know, instead of having a completely flat distribution, you have a kind of bias towards something. Mm. And if we want to replicate or replicate, it's not the ideal word, mm. but capture the essence of, let's say, mm. You know, we have to do capture their bias. Um, you know, maybe you have a bias towards recognizing the softness in harsh materials. I, I don't know. Yeah. That's a desirable bias. Mm -hmm. um, but would, yeah, it be able, would it be able to challenge the bias? So is it, it's noticed that Nick often picks up softness, but it, in order for Nick 2.0, yeah. you might want to... It's rec can it recommend? Yeah. See, this is, the, I think, the, where it gets really interesting yeah. and perhaps what you, you were hinting at as well where in trying to replicate yourself mm. you learn more about yourself yeah. and then you can maybe find that oh maybe I'm always tending too much towards this and then subconsciously and you think well maybe I'll consciously try going this way um, and then you discover a whole new world mm. about yourself mm. and so your practice goes to another level. Um, and the reason why I work with a lot of these technologies is not exactly that, because um, that's quite ambitious and I can't claim that I achieved that, but it, it's just exploratory, it's research. So in every research-driven exploratory project, I learn something about myself. And actually, particularly these kind of discussions are also insanely helpful because these kind of discussions help uh, me try to bring what's in my unconscious to the conscious, to be able to articulate it. I have to know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a turbo version of that if you get an AI to do it. Do you, do you see a point where you could fuse AI and a human? Is, is, that a sort of, is this an evolutionary way forward? I mean, it's the sort of thing that virtually everybody in the world goes, ooh, we don't want to have that. But is there a possibility that one could go on semi-machine, semi-human? Is that a sort of reasonable fusion? Well, I mean, arguably it already is. Like, yeah. Right? But you mean physically as one? Yeah. Um, again, already it exists. Yeah. Um, you know, there's prostheses are like yeah. that. I know a few cyborgs. Uh, Neil Harbison comes to mind who has a camera implanted in his skull. Mm. He's colorblind and the camera picks up color in the right. world and vibrates a bone in his yeah. ear. So he hears color right. and he's had it for over 10 years now. Um, and when I spoke to him many years ago, so that was, I don't know how many years into it, he, um, it, was a, it was a sense to him, like he didn't yeah. hear like the sound, he felt the color. Right. And so, um, like, I had a ginger friend who said, oh, yeah, he's F-sharp. Um, you know. Is he the one that did the TED Talk where he creates paintings yeah, he for creates each paintings, other? Yeah. yeah, very, like, abstract paintings. And the, yeah. he did two speeches, like Martin Luther King's speech and Hitler's speech. 
Oh, okay. I think if we're talking about the, I'm talking about the same person, and he was said, you know, which is visually more beautiful to you, but actually a lot of people said that Hitler's speech was really? more attractive. Oh, okay. Did mm. you create a, an abstract painting? It was yeah, it was kind of uh, like really linear. Yeah. Cube l- lines. Probably him, yeah. Yeah. But very colourful, like yeah, full like colour. Yeah, really, like nice yeah. and beautiful. Mm. Um, and he's fully colourblind from birth, so he's yeah. quite obsessed with the with the percept of colour yeah. because he's never experienced it. He doesn't know. Mm what it is. Yeah. Um, but but I'm, the whole area is synesthetic. You know, people who mix up senses, so yes. they taste colour or yeah. that sort of things. My brother has uh, that mildly. You mm. know, he says, well, Wednesdays are obviously yellow. It's like, yeah. Obviously. obviously. Um, <laughs> but, so there's that area which is, is, is actually super interesting as yeah. well. Of kind of like, you know, knowing you know, this sort of mix up of, the, of mm. the senses and trying to understand the world in a slightly different way around us. Well, I'm interested in is whether we're actually long term, you know, you look at evolution as a kind of force for good and actually the combination of a sort of a, a complete robotic or a complete artificial intelligence fusing with a human is something that actually is going to be desirable yeah. because it will help the species go on. Um, you know, whether that's something you believe is possible, or likely or, or desirable. So, yeah, going back to that, so already just starting from one point, you know, we are completely um, fused with AI in the sense that, you know, every time we pick up the phone, yeah. you know, we, we, we don't even store stuff on our devices. I mean, we store them in the cloud. Every time yeah. we type a question, yeah. it's going to the cloud. Yeah. We're going to these servers around the world and then coming back. It just so happens that we're physically, you know, disconnected from this thing. Like I can separate it. Yeah. But what, you know, to make this within the boundaries of the skin is, yeah. is such a trivial um, mm. thing. Yeah. To then connect this to our nervous system, uh, I think is very, very, very plausible. You know, we have prosthetics that are controlled via, you know, the muscles. Yeah. So I think that's very, very plausible. Whether it's desirable depends on who's developing the technology and why. Yeah. Uh, and on the current trajectory, obviously it's not being done uh, for benign purposes. It's done purely for profit, for surveillance, etc. Yeah. So I can only imagine that as these technologies become more integrated, um, it, it will be with the same motivations. So that's not desirable, I don't think. Mm. Um, also, you know, it's really difficult to imagine the future, you know, we always imagine what we have now, but slightly better. There's been this famous, so many um, wildly uh, crazy predictions of the future that was so of its time. But most likely what will happen is things that we can't even fathom to imagine. Yeah. Uh, like what AI will really do, the way AI will really change the world, I think is not the way a lot of sci-fi has seen smart robots and all yeah. that C-3PO and R2-D2 and stuff. Yeah. But what AI is today is it's the field of extracting meaningful information from data, from mm-hmm. big data. That's yeah. what AI, not the philosophical AI, but the field of AI mm-hmm. is. Yeah. You have a ton of data. How do I extract meaningful information from it? And so any breakthroughs in that field will contribute to any other field which is data driven. Mm. And in this day and age, every field is data driven biology, mm-hmm. physics economy, politics, yeah. everything. Yeah. So any breakthroughs in AI today will ultimately impact everything, biology, physics, economics, politics, psychology. So I think the bigger changes are gonna come from the discoveries that are gonna be made in whether it's the fundamental, physic, uh, fundamental sciences like physics or biology or psychology mm. with the help of these data-driven methods and then how those discoveries will impact our lives. Um, you know, if we're going to find a cure for leukemia or Alzheimer's, yeah. I think it will happen with data-driven methods. Maybe not deep learning, but the successor to deep learning. I also think if we decipher the three billion nucleotide pairs of our DNA, yeah. it's going to be with AI. Yeah. Not intelligent robots, but just simply the, the algorithms. Yeah. And this is quite exciting, but also quite terrifying because, you know, we have CRISPR, Cas9, combine that with that knowledge, 
No, oh, so I'm so, um, what's, what we have what, sorry? Oh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. Um, okay. It's a technology for like gene editing. Right. It's like a search and replace for genes. Okay. So it's been around for a couple of years, very controversial because, um, yeah, you can literally quite easily splice and edit DNA. Right. One of the issues is that we actually don't know, we don't have a lot of knowledge of what the whole DNA sequence does. So yeah. we've got this technology, but we don't really know, have a lot um, of information on what to do with it. But if somehow that is decoded, hmm. then it's plausible. Like imagine, this is a sci-fi fantasy scenario, but I think it's more plausible than having C3PO, which hmm. is, you know, boost your baby's IQ to 300. Hmm. But this is going to be a very expensive service, so only the super rich can do it. Yeah. Designer babies. Designer babies, yeah. Um, this is very plausible. This AI thing, are they um, under our control? So can they, um, because I heard this story like a few years back, um, the Facebook chat oh, yeah. started t talking to each other. And I wonder whether they can grow their self-awareness and out of control, out of human control can communicate to each other yeah. and do things like on their own. So that Facebook story was really, really atrocious uh, <laughs> reporting. Um, basically, they were trying to get, I, I forget the details, um, yeah. but it, it was something like they were trying to get to see if the two, um, so the, the headline was yeah. the system developed its own language, the computers, the AIs started speaking their own language, so the team, freaked out and shut them down. Yeah. What actually happened was they were trying to see if they could learn to communicate yeah. in a particular way. They didn't, so they stopped the experiment. Oh. And what they mean by they were communicating in their own language is that's what all computers do anyway. Like yeah. every time you connect to the internet, it's over TCP IP, there's a protocol. Yeah. Of course they communicate in their own language. I mean, they're not gonna communicate in English. So that, that was really, really bad, terribly bad, um, journalism, whether they will remain, regain, uh, remain in our control. So the bigger issue is basically human stupidity, like you know the Hawaii um, missile strike mm. example we can think of when someone kind of accidentally sent a warning to every single person yeah. in Hawaii that a missile strike is imminent. Yeah. Um, it's very, very easy for these systems to go out of control, mm. but not because they become self-aware, because someone does something stupid. Mm. Um, the much more tragic than the Hawaii incidents, because obviously nothing bad happened in the end, but like the plane crashes with the new, um, mm. is it the Boeing? Or there's a, you know, the new yeah, Airbus. Yeah, the ones recall like every, everyone. Yeah, the, the, that it had a, a nosedive. There was an error in, it kept nosediving. So there, I think there were two crashes so far yeah. this year on the last year and then the pilots. So they changed the software and, I mean, this is absolutely tragic because planes actually crashed. And when I looked, I'm not an expert in aviation or anything, but when I looked into it, it turns out that it's a bit, bit human, human user error in the sense that when that happens, you're supposed to respond in a particular way. But it wasn't communicated very well, the pilots weren't trained. Basically, people fucked up. Mm. Um, and so what happened was, the humans couldn't control the autonomous systems. But this isn't the autonomous system gaining um, you know, awareness or looking at the human. This is just bad design, bad management, mm. bad coding, bad design on every level. Mm. So that's absolutely a risk. And as systems become more powerful, more autonomous, with more uh, impact on the world, it becomes more critical mm. that we have to make sure we design systems well, we have more people involved. Um, yeah, it's very, very serious threats. Mm. But again, not self-awareness. It's just us not doing our job properly. Do you think they will gain self-awareness in the future? Um, so we don't really know, or I don't really know what self-awareness means. When I say self-awareness, I meant more like really first degree, like when you watch Netflix TV series, whatever then the robot became to think that 
who am I? Yeah. And they do things that are not programmed to do yeah. by a kind of random chance. Yeah. So that kind of thing that I'm talking about, like oh, okay. going out of control, um, out that, of the programming yeah. um, or algorithm. Yeah. So that's absolutely possible. And it already, I mean, arguably, so it already is happening in the sense that as soon as you have a machine that can learn, um, that is almost inevitable. Mm. So our, like AlphaGo does that to some degree. It stays within its objective, which is to play Go. Um, but what it actually does to get there is not programmed, it, it's learned. So it does things which humans um, were not expecting. You know, there's a famous uh, paperclip example that mm. everyone loves to quote uh, by Nick Bostrom, which is, if you give the machine a goal, and even if that goal is quite benign or mm. productive, it might take paths to that goal that are undesirable. So in the case of the paperclip example, um, which I'm not a big fan of, uh, if its goal is to make the most profitable business making paper clips, mm -hmm. it might decide, oh, I'll just turn the entire world into paper clips. Oh, all of these people, they're wasting valuable resource. I'll just recycle their car carbon matter to make more paper clips. So it'll destroy everything and make the most paper clips. Mm. And so the reason why I'm not a big fan of this example is, well, it, it serves a purpose, but I don't like it because it's too fear-mongering, in my view. Yeah. Because an AI that's smart enough to be able to know that should be able to learn our values. And this is called like the value alignment problem. How do you align our values with an AI? Nevertheless, it does have a valid point, which is, we are not able to foresee everything. Mm. And as, like I said, machines become more powerful, small mistakes that we make may lead to quite disastrous results. Yeah. Um, I prefer, not the paperclip example, but um, from uh, Asimov's iRobot. Mm. Uh, he had a story where, uh, so there were the three laws of robotics, quite famously, yeah. uh, one, a, you, a robot, oh, I have to remember this, a robot can't harm another human mm -hmm. by action or through inaction. Two, a robot can't harm another robot, including itself, by action or through inaction. And three, um, it must obey it humans mm -hmm. unless it contradicts one or two. Mm -hmm. So, there was a film I wrote with Will Smith, which has yeah. got nothing to do with the book, by the way. It's kind of inspired, but it's a kind of bad hmm. Hollywoodization. But what's really interesting in, in one of the short stories, it's very subtle. The robots decide that to protect humans, um, they need to uphold the first law. What they have to do is they have to rule the planet because that's the only way they can stop war. So they see this as an optimization problem. The way we can minimize human suffering is if we overcome and if we rule them, but they're not allowed to do that. So they evolve and they find these insane loopholes to elect a, a robot president. Um, and it's really quite incredible the lengths that they go to to do this, just to minimize human suffering. Mm. So this, I think, is a much more subtle and kind of poetic version of the red paper clip example. Yeah in that we set a goal, we think it's benign, but on that journey to that goal, the system might do things which we had not predicted. Package, yeah. But it can't deny that goal. Um, or... It depends how you program it, because at the end of the day, we are creating these. So then again, the, the um, singularitists would argue we design the first generation and then they design the next generation. And the next. So then it goes completely out of control. Again, that is plausible. Um, it's not something I'm worried about because the, you know, we might get invaded by aliens. Like it's, it's in my mind, it's literally the same mm. possibility. Mm. Um, what are you worried about, incidentally? <laughs> is there a particular thing that's, that with your knowledge and your, and your experience in this field that is worrying you? Yeah, the, the thing that's worrying me the most is 
what are we going to learn? Mm. Because that's, again, like I said, what these technologies do. They extract yeah. information from big data. What are we going to learn um, about ourselves yeah. and the universe mm. that maybe we shouldn't have learned? Right. And can you explain what, what should we not learn? What are you worried about that we would learn? So, Well, f for example, things that could lead to um, designer babe, genetic editing. Yeah. Uh, that yeah, could really dramatically boost the amount of inequality. Yeah. Um, you know, creating a sub, not subs, like a, um, a is subspecies the right word? Like, super species? Like a super species of 300 plus IQ humans. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that's plausible. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I would love to think that it would be plausible, I don't know if it is, if we could create humans that could photosynthesize. Mm. I mean, these sound insanely sci-fi, mm. but I think that's more plausible than like the singularity fears. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think if we could photosynthesize, that would be amazing. You lie in the sun, you get your energy, mm. and maybe it tastes like an amazing steak, just mm. the act yeah. of yeah. Um, absorbing the sun. So it's, it's those kind of things, or um, do all the way, do away with all that digestive tracts and stuff that's yeah. littering up our bodies. Yeah, it's like an evolutionary byproduct of something. I don't know. And what, I mean, you probably have answered the question just within that, but I was going to say, if that's what you fear, then what, what are you most excited about? Then? Yeah. So again, the, the things. So, I mean, I'm not necessarily one that. Um, I'm not for immortality, like, you know, mm. lots of transhuman stuff or immortality, but, you know, certain things, like people should have quality lives. Yeah. Whatever the lifespan is, you know, certain things should go, like things that take away decent quality lives, you know, mm. cancer, leukemia, Alzheimer's, all of these yeah. kind of illnesses that, yeah. um, and I think it's plausible to, eradicate at least some of those with these data-driven technologies like AI. And also discoveries in fundamental physics, you know, like we just saw a photo of a black hole. Yeah. You know, I'm really into that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, we listened to um, gravitational waves, mm. two supermassive black holes colliding a billion years ago. Mm. I think that I find that stuff very exciting. And that, that's not AI, but it's, the line is blurrier than I think most people realize, because at the end of the day, for example, detecting that um, the gravitational waves involves super smart theoreticians, yeah. super smart experimental designers to design yeah. the apparatus, super smart engineers, but also super smart computational systems mm. that analyze this, petabytes of data, like yeah. tons and tons of data, analyze that data to find like those signatures. So it's, it's data processing. Yeah. And what we call AI today is a more advanced form of that data processing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think AI will help us discover new things about the universe, mm -hmm. yeah. which I'm personally interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a good place to stop the conversation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're really upset. You, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask one question, though. No, um, please. I'm, 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 I was only just talking because I could spend all afternoon days, but I'm sure. Yeah, I, I need bathroom too. But um, <laughs> you mentioned that you can you, go and come back. It's yeah, I can. Kind of but yeah, uh, you. <laughs> I'll keep my answer short. I'll try. So I can <laughs> please too much. cut and then yeah, continue. Um, you mentioned that you can create next photograph like yeah. this if you have the pictures yeah. um, like uh, um, enough data yeah would that be then the mixture of all these pictures look like would, would it look like the mixture of all these pictures people when see it, when people see it hmm. would they notice that okay this is what all this are mixed up like hmm. really oh, in a clever yeah, way yeah. or would it be like would it look completely different okay that's a good good question so it depends on the algorithm mm -hmm. The current state of the art algorithms, the theory is, or not is a theory, the goal is that it learns, like, and the, the spiel is, it learns the underlying structure of mm -hmm. whatever system it is that gave rise to these. Mm -hmm. So, I don't, 
how much you believe that is, um, you know, I don't know, it's, it's up to you. Or, but the, the idea is that it wouldn't create an average of all of them. The system would learn, the system in the computational system would learn to emulate, or hopefully would learn to emulate whatever it is that gave rise to these. Mm. So then you could say, create me one, and it would create maybe one of these exactly, but another one that comes from the same system. Yeah. And the system in this case are uh, these flowers that are lit in a particular way, mm -hmm. that have a particular color palette, mm -hmm. that is composed in a particular way. So it learns that. Now, how far deep does it go? Does it go all the way down to the molecular level? No, it, go, it doesn't go too deep. Um, but I th it's plausible that in the future it will go even deeper. Mm. You know, the more data you give it, instead of flowers like giving it trees and dogs and cats, which is obviously what we do today, and it learns something about the natural world, but mm. not enough to produce completely realistic. Yeah. Like right now to get, like if you've seen very recent results um, on human faces, yeah. they're completely believable. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of, they only feed it human faces. If you feed, feed it human faces and cats and dogs and submarines and bananas and buildings, chances are it's not gonna create each one of those perfectly. It's not because that's too complicated a system mm. to be able to learn. Um, but again, that's the direction that we're heading in. Th here there's so much homogeneity, with so much structure yeah. that I think it'd be relatively easy to learn. Mm -hmm. um, you can see from my point of view, the attraction of that. Yeah. Because if we go, if we say, okay, we, can, we reckon that's a possible thing that in some years, not very many, that somebody or an AI can recreate this and I'm still alive. So it can represent it to me like, so well, actually, no. You, mm. You're missing this, this, and this. This is yeah. good, but this isn't. So I can then direct it, and I can shape that. Yeah. And you could have that. And you know, the idea is that you leave it as a, you know, in the most simple term, I leave it for my children. So you know, the AI that I have shaped, created, and to some degree has fed off my knowledge. Yeah. You know, it's left to the, keep on creating things that people would like to see. Yeah. So you can see the desire to do that isn't totally. necessarily just a sort of, you know, how can I keep on living? But it's more yeah. of a sort of you know, it seems a shame. In a, because I'm 60, I have to yeah. contemplate death. So yeah. I can't, it would be silly not to. When you're in your 20s or 30s, you don't have to because it's so far away. But by the time you get to 60, there's a realism that, you know, in the next foreseeable future that would happen. So it's a sort of a feeling of before time runs out for me, um, it seems a shame to spend 60 years working on this to then say, oh, pompy, doesn't matter, we can let it generate and die. Was actually, if I have the power within the next yeah. few years to be able to start to work on this, it's a desirable thing to do. And it, as I yeah. said, it isn't the sort of God complex of wanting to go on forever. It's more that it just seems a waste. Yeah. To have got to a point, and I'm not trying to value what I do, but to have got to a point in my life where I've been able to study photography for 40 years, to you know, kind of train my eye to do things, et cetera, et cetera, and, and my emotions and all, et cetera. So I'm starting to learn the clues of it, to give up on it, Mm. and just let it disappear, it seems a bit of a shame. Mm. I think it's an absolutely fascinating um, question mm. to be able to understand. Like I said, to replicate this is not necessarily that tricky, maybe. I mean, I'm not saying it's trivial, but no, no, no. It, it's doable. But the, you know, what you are is more than this project, mm -hmm. yeah. it's all of the projects, and it's also the evolution of the projects, like the order of the projects matters in the sense that how have you developed? Um, and one and other interesting fact that you mentioned made me think of, you know, there was that um, Beatles song yeah. um, Francois, by Francois Pache and his team. Um, so he's an expert in computational music yeah. and replicating styles, so h him and his team, they developed this. Actually, no, it's not the Beatles thing I want to talk about. So anyway, they developed the Beatles thing, but no, yeah. the one I want to talk about is not that. It's the Google Doodle of Bach. Um, I don't know if you, a few days, a few weeks ago, yeah. there was a Google Doodle for Bach, right. where you could, with, from Google Magenta, the team yeah. at Magenta, Google Magenta, where you type in just a few notes, yeah. and then it harmonizes like Google, uh, like Bach, right. and it sounds to most people just like Bach. Mm. Yeah. But then all the Bach experts yeah. came out and said, oh, this is terrible, <laughs> this is really wrong, Bach would never use that yeah. kind of counterpoint <laughs> yeah. after that, and they yeah. started ripping it apart. 
And so you know, I know the guy who runs Magenta Dark Egg, and he's like, you know, the point is, my grandma just placed things on the laptop and it sounded just like Bach. Mm -hmm. To 99% of the population, it sounds just like Bach. But to the Bach experts, they know it's wrong. Um, so the interesting thing would be, it, it's plausible that, say, we get a system that replicates you to the extent that most people in the world would say, yeah, that's yeah. totally. But yeah. you'd be like, no, 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 it's missing the key point. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. never yeah. have you chosen that mm. yeah. um, tiny little detail that maybe no one else picks up on consciously, but subconsciously it's... Yeah. And what you pick up very, very astutely is the fact that, you know, it's a, in a time sequence. Yeah. So you do this because you've done that. Mm. Yeah. And I see a lot of what I do best seen as opening doors to different rooms. And so with this series, I start to open a door for myself to see, you know, things from a different way. And from that room, I can then go into another room. But they're all decisions that I make based on where I've been, yeah. etc. Et if you just take one thing, it doesn't tell you what you would have done in two rooms' time. Do you see yeah, what I mean? So totally, it, yeah. And the information, the data that you want that would come in in a new room is totally different or, or the data you haven't got before. And then you, the combination of those different sets of data and the decisions made are not just dependent on what you've done before because mm. they're also dependent on what that data excites in you. So it's a, that's sort of why I'm sort of interested. In. But that's also why I'm keen to get it going now. Yeah. Because I just think, as you say with the back thing, that, that it's a little bit like, well, he would have never done that. Yeah. If he was around said, no, I would have never done that, but I yeah. would have done this. And then you reprogram it with his yeah. opinion and therefore you get a better simulation of it and more beautiful music. Yeah. So. I mean, the, the really key thing is, I mean, the AI we have today is really dumb in the sense that it, you know, it, it is literally just software. You, mm. you program it, you say, do this, and it does that and it's able to perform lots of computations. Um, but ultimately, to really achieve what you want to do, you know, you would have, which maybe if you've already done, you sit down and think, what is it that I do? What is it that motivates me? Yeah. How do I start a project? Um, and do loads of self-analysis. Mm. And that's, from that, you will learn well, what is it that, what data do we put into the system? Is it just the images you've made? Yeah. Or is it the images that you've made and, I don't know, the news of the time? Like, yeah. how, how have you responded to what's happening in the world around you? Yeah. Um, those kind of things. So that does become a hugely important part of it. I, get, I have, since I've had children, well, before I had children, I was less responsive to the world around me. So when I started having children, I've got three, um, I started to get much, a, a more different emotional approach to the world around me. Yeah. So I was much more upset by the news. Yeah. I was much more kind of involved in it. And now recently, politically, I've been yeah. incredibly more involved in it. And that probably is with increasing age and realizing that, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, so it is, you know, the, there are new factors yeah. that come into it that make you respond in a new way. You're not just building a logical yeah. sort of linear way, yeah. you know, step by step. There are things that take you into places which you would never thought you wanted to go and make work you never wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, news, in terms of headlines, politically, but also culturally, like um, yeah. even emerging technologies, like even your response to AI mm. is a part of your practice. Yeah, very much.